First, I want to thank you, all of you, to coming to, to my talk. I'm really impressed to give, as usual, to give a talk in front of this audience. Even more impressed for the, because it was for the birthday of Uriel. And I just want to add one word about the relation between mathematics and physics, which is a thing which is very often discussed. What is clear for me is that Uriel knows much more mathematics than me, and that I learned a lot of mathematics working with him over the 60, 60 years. He was patient and generous. Thank you, Uriel. So that's a comment. Now uh, I move to this Thank talk. You. Maybe, maybe some people have met, uh, already heard it, but anyway, I want to move to slides. It's not that okay. Let's move this way. It's full screen. It's a slide of a mathematician. Oh, what all this thing? You know, on Saga, you know, Kolmogorov. And this guy maybe is not so known from the physics community. It's uh, Kato. And there's a picture on t grid turbulence, which I borrowed from Uriel. Okay, from the book of Uriel. Now, what I do will do are the reports, which some, pe some people may have heard a part of it, on the series of contribution with Edwin Stiti mostly, with the Wiedman, Gviadza, the two uh, Gviadza, and it's really I want to focus on the boundary effect in field mechanics. And uh, I want really to compare the weak convergence in the viscosity, zero viscosity limit and the anomalous energy dissipation. And to the natural link, of course, for this audience is first the Kolmogorov one third uh, law. And you can translate this Kolmogorov one third law into what it is the Onsager conjecture, which in fact was almost a proof. And that's uh, my starting point. I want to give some extension of this conjecture for in two directions. First, to talk about general system and also to uh, make a local version of this conjecture. And that will lead me to this basic theorem of Cato and what it failed it uh, fits in my talk is because if I use the Cato theorem, I can find the configuration where the absence of anomalous energy dissipation is completely equivalent to the persistence of regularity in the zero viscosity limit in the sense that there is an if and only if statement. So that's the talk. If people have known that or heard that already, they can live. So very shortly, the Kolmogorov for a mathematician, for a mathematician that doesn't know anything, you write the balance of energy, and then you write the increases of regularity, which is the difference of the solution at the point X plus L minus the solution at the point L, the, at the point x divided by the modulus of l at the power beta, you have this dissipation of energy that you see there, which in fact is also this quantity. Now you compare these two quantities and you should say, assume that you have isotropy, homogeneity, what will be the number beta such that they will be related? And you find by dimension analysis that there is only number which is one third. And that's the result. Now, if you want to do something more serious, one of the way you really use the hypothesis of homogeneity for the turbulence, and you go back to the book of Uriel, page 77, and you have a complete proof for that. That's the point. Now, with that in mind, I keep this magic number one third, and I look at the older regularity of the solution, C0 for alpha greater than one third. <coughs> and then, 
For solution of the incompressible error equation, it was proven. Uh, Greg did the first paper in our mathematical community, building from Onsager, as he said, and then they have the paper that you see there, that uh, the result of this paper is that if you have a solution of the Euler equation, you know that, that is more regular than one third in Euler spaces, then it do conserve the energy. And there was a big uh, increase of uh, interest of the, on this topic because around uh, there were several papers going back to 2017 uh, where these people, Buchmaster, Edris, Delelli, Sekedili, Vlad Vickel, they have proved that for alpha, that for alpha less than one third, that do exist what they call the wild solution built on convex integration in such a, that do not satisfy the uh, energy conservation. So it's a necessary and sufficient condition in the sense that all the solution for half, more regular than one third conserve the energy and if they are and if you relax the one third you have some solution that do not conserve the energy so i want just to elaborate on this question all solution okay so that's the point and the first way to elaborate to all this uh, the, the necessity or sufficiency of the one third condition was simple exam that we built up with Adris, built on the shear flow or flow rotating flow, in such a way that you had solutions that do not satisfy the uh, one third regularity, but you observe simply that they uh, satis conserve the energy, and if you get at the corresponding solution for Navier-Stokes, you take the vis zero viscosity limit, and you see that there is no anomalous energy dissipation in this case. So to try to understand slightly more this topic, we generalize the problem to a series of other equation and found out that the condition alpha greater than one third is a sufficient condition for the conservation of energy. We found out also, and we see also an example of Greg that you can see on the slide, we found that there are many examples, in particular on compressible fluid, for which you can relax the condition and you find an alpha less than one third, which imply the conservation of energy. So, to go on, I want uh, on, along this line, I want first to analyze the local, the validity of the one third uh, sufficient condition, and we found out that the best way to look at it is to uh, follow Duchamp Robert, and we ga they gave a local version of this conservation of energy of the own circuit. So it's what I want to show in the next slide. So I move from the incompressible error equation to a system of conservation law. System of conservation law is an equation like one where you have the sum of d over dxi of ai of u, ai a matrix value function from a vector u Rn to Rl, say, and they satisfy this relation. This relation contains mostly all the equation of macroscopic physics, uh, uh, compressible fluid, elasticity, MHD, and so on. Now, the, what is the theorem one, which I want to say? I look at this equation and I assume that they have an integrating factor. Integrating factor will be a b of u, such that the vector b i b one of u, b two of u, b l of u, in such a way that if for smooth solution, you take the scalar product of b of u against the gradient 
with respect of the, the uh, of you of the AI of you, this turns out to be exactly a gradient, a flux. So if you put uh, do, if you expand this expression in the equation and take the derivative is here, you compute the derivative, you find the right hand side of the equation two, and the right hand side is the sum of dui of qi of u dxj of ui. And from the right hand side, you find immediately that if everything is smooth, you just get that the sum of the dxi of qi of u is equal to zero, which is an extra conservation law for this uh, the system. Now, uh, the question, of course, and then this computation is formal. The message I want to show, tell you, is that in the sense of distribution, this relation will be true, not only formal, but true whenever you have locally, the k goes for local, a locally regularity alpha of k, which is greater than one third. And I want to show you the proof because it really emphasizes the role of the sufficient condition for that. Of course, this, if I do that, it's also that so because the earlier equation fits completely in this form. Here is our incompressible earlier equation we have been talking about at the beginning of this meeting, I write A0 is zero, 0 V because you have not, no d, d time derivative of the pressure. And then I write AI of U as matrix whose components are the tensor VIVJ minus pressure delta IJ for I equal 1, 2, 3. The index 0 is for the time. I write Q of G, the Q of zero will be eta of U that you know, which is the energy V square, v square and the flux is V square over two plus P multiplied by V I. Okay, so now I want to show you basically the proof. The proof goes back in this thing. I want to show that in the sense of distribution, I have the sum of d over dx i of q i of u against the test function phi is equal to zero, which means I move the d over dx i on phi. So I do that, and uh, then, as all the pre previous authors, like uh, Greg, as the first one in our community, I use a modifier. And to make it local, what I do, I have this very naive picture. I have a domain where I know that I have the older, older condition, one third. Then I have a much smaller domain, the smaller domain, which is the support of the test function phi. I ex so I can extend this function u outside of this bigger ball, a bigger domain just by zero. And the game is that if I do that, the use of the modifier will generate a singularity, but if epsilon is small enough, this singularity will not affect the region, small region, where is the support of phi. So that's the way I do that. Then I use a take of text function, I take this u bar overline of u and I regularize it, multiply by phi in the same way I get rid of the singularity which are generated away, and I will do the formal usual computation with a phi here, put it in the theorem, and apply just the definition of derivative of the sense of distribution and the Fubini theorem to integrate by part. The point is that now I'm dealing with regular things, so it's one line, I do it. I have the Fubini theorem here, I integrate by part, and I turn as exactly in the book, all elementary book on uh, uh, nonlinear PD or like in the book of the Fermos, end up with something which is nice, uh, which is standard here. And then uh, what's happened in this construction is that I have 
ex, ex, multiple, uh, extended by zero, a non take a nonlinear function of the extension by zero, regularized by epsilon. So what I do, I replace that by the epsilon of f epsilon ai again something which is irregular and then comes a difference between these two terms which is the term in blue so in short this will give me this term will give me the standard computation related to, uh, to entropy and i just have to estimate the other term and the starting point is that to estimate, so this, this first term will be exactly the standard thing, but I have to estimate the second term in this equation. Now, the st starting uh, point is that to estimate the effect of the second term, it's, it, it, will, it will be this quantity against this difference, the difference between the nonlinearity of a regular rise and the regular rise after that and the uh, a of u of the extended regular rise. So you have the epsilon outside here, inside there. Now if I do that, I spare you the computation, I end up with this, this essential term and for this essential term I have the de derivative of phi which is regularized and I have against the difference between extended by zero regularized take the nonlinear part or, or first extended by zero take the nonlinear part and then regularize and that's a nonlinear thing so the first term will be standard you just take the derivative of something which has been modified which you assume locally to be alpha so you, it's something which is epsilon alpha minus one because you have one derivative here. Now, what you can do for the second term, for the second term, you just use the Taylor formula to, uh, and uh, look at the definition of, and the definition of what is the regularization. Now, for the regularization, for the regularization, you have. What's happening is Vx of xy minus Vx of z, and it's, it's a square term. So at the end of the day, you make here the Taylor computation, and what you will get, which is the essential thing, is since it's second order, it's a Taylor computation, there will be epsilon at the power 2 alpha. So here you have 1 alpha, here you have 2 alpha, that makes 3 alpha minus 1, and 3 alpha makes, to make it positive, you have 2 alpha to be greater than 1 third. So that's the story. Now, what this story can be extended very easily to a cylinder, to a domain which is a cylindrical in time, which t1, t2, that's the time, multiplied by omega. So I make, try to make it global, and I look at this equation, dt of a0 of u plus sigma of dxi of ai of u. And then I have a system, it's, it's in this setting, it's uh, the natural to associate it to the flux what will be eta of u, which is called an entropy. And this, and, and this entropy is as, uh, as associated to the different fluxes, which I call qi of u. So I do that, move that on the top, do exactly the computation that we had done in the previous slide, and if everything works well, I found out that I have for the conservation dt of the entropy plus the sum of the flux qi of u equals zero, which is, and which is the same logic as the one that I did, had in the previous slide, logic being there is a computation which is valid for smooth solution, how it can be valid for a uh, more general case. And this previous, the previous case was just local. Now I want to extend it to a situation with boundary, so I want to take in account of the boundary effect. So that's the point I want to do. Okay, so for that, I have a theorem, 
And the TOM says that the, they have the conservation of the entropy, which is the conclusion. Here is the TOM. It says to give the conservation of the entropy. The hypothesis is first that for any subdomain, as the case where I made this, this picture, for any subdomain, I have some older regularity with some alpha greater than one third. It can be as close as one third for any domain, but I want to have it va valid for subdomain. And then there is another condition which involves the boundary. I take a delta small fixed, or given, but small enough, and I introduce the distance of a point to the boundary of the domain. And I want that this integral, which is computed over the time from T1 to T2, but which affect only a region close to the boundary, but not involving the boundary itself. So the distance to the boundary is greater than delta over 4 and uh, less than delta over 2, less than the given delta 0. And I want take this integral in time and it's this boundary layer, there will be boundary layer in the rest of my talk, 1 over delta, this quantity which is nothing else than the flux, than the extension in the domain of the flux against the normal component, uh, 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 normal component to the boundary, and I want all this quantity to go to zero. And the theorem says that if I 1 and 2, I have the conservation of the entropy. Okay, and the proof you can guess, I just introduced test function that will truncate the solution near the boundary. They will truncate the solution near the boundary, and uh, then it, I take a, a a smooth function k of x will, will be a cutoff of the distance, which means it will be equal to 0 for s, uh, equal to 1 for s greater than 1 half, and equal to 0 for s less than 1 half. And I look at what happens on the entropy multiplied by this function, and what is what will be the derivative with respect to time. So I turn the crank in, after I've been multiplied by this test function, which is here, turn the crank, get very nicely an equation which will be zero because this quantity is zero inside, is a conservation inside, and there is a term near the boundary. And the term near the boundary, since the grid, it, it will involve this derivative of d, d of x, the distance over delta, which may, will generate the normal component on the boundary, because the gradient of the distance to x to d omega, when the distance is close, is small, is small, is exactly the normal at the boundary. And then this is exactly the quantity which will go to zero, and one conclude with the Lebesgue theorem. Now, what is natural is to write the same thing for any Lure of solution of Navier-Stokes. So you have our favorite, na now favorite natural Navier-Stokes. You look at a Lure of Ford solution in 3D, and you, of course, you make no assumption on the pressure. So I assume a very weak, which will be enough, I don't elaborate on that, hypothesis on the pressure near the boundary, but no other hypothesis. By ellipticity, that will imply that the pressure inside the domain is the, has the same regularity as the solution. So I, impl so I assume that for any subdomain, I have an C0 alpha regularity with one third, which I call the local hypothesis. And here is, here is a local hypothesis. And then I have an hypothesis on the flux near the boundary. And the hypothesis on the flux is the same thing as integrate from the distance to the boundary greater than one fourth 
to something which is theta over one for to something which is less than eta over two, the quantity which will correspond to the flux. Here it's u nu square over two p nu multiplied by e nu. That's the uh, that will be the flux multiplied by the normal on the boundary. So this is a quantity. I look at what happened to this quantity when eta goes to zero, for, when nu goes to zero, first when nu goes to zero with eta fixed. And then I take the limit for eta going to zero and I assume that all that goes to zero. That's the hypothesis. So with this hypothesis, I claim that are the hypothesis. I claim that u epsilon will converge weakly to a solution to weak solution of the Euler equation, and will and I will assume that this weak solution uh, satisfy the and I claim that this weak solution satisfy the hypothesis of the previous theorem. With this hypothesis and the regular un, the weak solution will be continuous in L2, conserve the energy, and there will be no this energy dissipation, which means the quant integral from zero to t of the integral of the gradient of x of u nu squared dx is equal to zero. So that uh, and uh, you can guess, maybe I've been speaking talking too fast, but you can guess really. How uh, it works uh, with the with low with the with the uh, c zero alpha regularity local inside under pressure. You have the convergence of the weak solution of the earlier equation, and then with the eta, you find that it satisfied the the hypothesis of the first theorem. You uh, the second hypothesis, which is here, which is the hypothesis 15, can be said uh, involving what is the Bernoulli pressure, and you show that this influence of the Bernoulli pressure on the boundary will go to zero, so you will have the conservation of energy, and if you have the conservation of energy, knowing that the energy of the limit is less than the limit of the energy, by a simple uh, balance of the energy, you find that the dissipation goes to zero. And that's done. Okay, that's what I told you. Now, uh, just I want to comment on this very simple result. The first thing is that the uniform no free hypothesis concerns the normal component of the velocity and it's really the prank. And since I'm starting to look at boundary layer for navier stokes, I keep in mind the comparison with the Prandtl equation. Prandtl equation, they were divide, uh, derived by the, uh, the name of Prandtl, who derived them in 1904 or something like that, that turned out to be the basic example of all problem in boundary layer for the future. But it's a very intricated one, as we will see. And uh, then when I say it's not in contradiction, it's just a simple remark that if I assume that the Prandtl equation have a smooth solution, and second that, they, re they really describe the lim sharply the limit, the behavior of the solution of Navier-Stokes when u goes to zero. Then this implies my hypothesis on the no flux component of the velocity. Very good. So it's not in contradiction. Second, I want to emphasize that this hypothesis on the no flux is something which is not redundant. In fact, I, I, uh, in a paper with Laszlo and Widman, I try to use their notion of weak solution to show that this is not redundant. And the way to do that, you construct very simple example where you have stationary solutions which are very regular, and you also have weak solution with wild solution 
which are wild near the boundary with the same initial data. And you find out that without this criteria, you don't, you may not know, except in specific examples, whether or not the, the, the limit will be the solution which conserves the energy, because you have wild solution. So that's, in some sense, uh, that illustrate two things. First, the use of the notion of wild solution in the general uh, landscape, and second, that this hypothesis on the flux is not redundant. Now, I want to that's introduce me to the second part of my talk, which is the Cato theorem, because I insist on the Cato theorem because it's a configuration, to the best of my knowledge, it is the only one where you have a complete equivalence between the non the fact that the solution will remain smooth for t going for viscosity going to zero and the fact that you have no anomalous energy dissipation and it's in this case it, it's a complete if and only if theorem and that's what i want to illustrate and comment on that before the end of my talk okay you are with me so, yeah, there is a price to pay th uh, for that, is to assume that you look at the evolution equation, you look at the evolution equation near a solution of Euler equation which is smooth. You assume that the Euler equation, that you are looking at the zero viscosity limit of Navier-Stokes near a Euler equation. Now, uh, there is a standard trick. Now, if you do that, what you uh, do, what the standard trick of mathematician is just to integrate by part for people of my generation, take the difference between the Navier-Stokes equation, which is here, and the Euler equation. So you take the difference between the Navier-Stokes and the Euler, and by very standard trick, you uh, look, get the difference between the energy minus the integral over omega, the gradient of u square. Now, I want to insist for the Cato theorem that it concerns solution of Navier-Stokes, which have at the boundary a no-slip boundary condition, which is that at the boundary the solution is, the velocity is zero at the boundary. And I want to convince you that it is the most natural condition because it's the most complicated one and the nature being complicated, it contains what we see. Okay, so I assume that u is zero on the boundary. I have to take the difference with the Euler equation integrate by part, multiply, integrate, and the point is that since the, the, no, the Euler equation is not zero, when I do the integration by part, I get a term which I call the bad term. This term, bad term, is minus nu, the integral over d omega of the normal derivative of u nu against, on the trace, on the boundary, uh, uh, the normal derivative of the tangential u nu sca scalar product with u on the boundary. And why the tangential? Because the normal component of Euler is zero, so you just have the tangential component of zero. Okay, very good. So, now, if there will be no boundary, this term will be equal to zero, and I will have nothing to say about that. And then that I claim is that this term is rich of meaning and it creates a much more subtle computation, observation. So the first observation is that this term may prevent that the limit be the nice solution and the most natural example is to look at what's happened in airfoil. Since the velocity of the solution of 
hull of the Navier-Stokes is zero on the boundary, and since the velocity of the fluid may be ze down zero outside, you get in general for viscosity going to zero a uh, recirculation, which people have studied in many uh, from different many different aspects, but is there. What is the recirculation? The recirculation is what will increase this negative part. So this, because it, this, you have an opposite direction between the velocity here and the velocity of the, the earlier equation. So you have a quantity which has the wrong sign, but multiplied by nu, but it's not so big. So, so the issue is whether this quantity will go to zero or not. And this very naive theorem, as I said, says that if that this if this is not too big at the limit, it will disappear because we will have the just the solution of the earlier equation, and it will be the end of the story. Now, to build on that, we expanded uh, such a type of theorem. I did we work on with Idris is to expand the Cato theorem of 1984 and write several different interpretations of this theorem, which are all equivalent, okay? So there are many of them, some are pure logic, there are five, but some have an important physical meaning. So the first thing which I just wrote above, this contribution, recircling is not too big. Now, this the fact that it is not too big is clearly implied by the fact that if you take a, a tangential vector field W, you t instead of the solution of the earlier equation, which would you compare, multiply by dv over you take the limit, this is equal to zero. So this is general case, this is a special case. Now you go back from this equation, you go back to the ba energy balance for all the system, which is here, and then you find out that if uh, this goes to zero, this negative part goes to zero, you will have strong convergence in L2, so infinity with value in L2, don't care too much, to the solution of Euler, which I did assume to be smooth. Now, if you have a strong convergence, you have the weak convergence also. But for the weak, uh, that's a trick of, it's not very important, the trick of mathematician, but if you have the weak convergence to something which conserves the energy, you have the conservation of the energy with plus weak in convergence implies strong convergence, Strong convergence in the energy balance implies that this quantity will go to zero because it's a term which appears in the energy balance. Now this term is integrated over all the space omega. This next one is just integrated. It implies that in a small region, new time, the integral from zero to t, the integral of omega, of in, a, in a region which is of the side between zero and nu over two of the gradient of u nu square dx dt goes to zero. Now, if it goes to zero, I claim that if I divide by one over nu, the integral from zero to t of the integral not everywhere, but in the region between the distance to the boundary is greater than nu over four and is less than nu over two, nu over four, nu over two, divide by one over two, multiply by u nu squared dx dt, this quantity goes to zero. And this relation 23 will imply the relation 17. So what I want now, all these hypotheses are really anki trot at say Laurent Schwartz, but the last point is what it is, the Cato theorem. I will elaborate on it. 
and just going to, just going to go from 22 to 23, you use the fact that u nu is equal to zero on the boundary and going from a gradient of u square to something which is u square itself is what is known for pro elliptic problem with boundary value as the Poincaré inequality or Adamar Poincaré inequality. And that's enough to go, f that's, you just say that and you go from 22 to 23. Now going to 23 to 17 is the, uh, uh, the Cato issue. And I will just to tell you how you do that. So for at some point before looking at, already looking at the zero viscosity solution of Navier-Stokes, which were regular inside and uh, which satisfied the Bernoulli condition near the boundary, I did introduce a truncation near the boundary, now which kills everything near the boundary. Now the idea of Cato is to do the opposite, is to construct an ansatz that will coincide with the test function on the boundary and that will live in a small region. So this is the ansatz. You, don't, you take the normal on the boundary, you take the, the wedge, the vector product with the value of the vector sigma of x dx on the boundary, you multiply it by the distance to the function which is distance for the boundary, and you truncate here. Now, what you observe is that it satisfies the boundary condition. Since it's a wave, it satisfies the divergence of the extension is equal to zero because you take the curl of the you take the divergence of the curl it's zero, and it lives in the convenient region the boundary. Now, after that, you look at some property of this equation, and you find out that if you compute. The what I would now call the recirculation in the vector W, you get it by multiplying the equation Navier-Stokes, the original Navier-Stokes equation by W nu, integrating to a part, turning the crank, and the both, the only serious thing will be the tensor U nu, tensor of U nu against the gradient of W nu, so you have U nu, U nu, you did add a new year, and this exact to have this term going to zero, you need this quantity going to zero, which was my last hypothesis, which says that at the end of the day, this will go to zero. Okay, so that's th that was in a, in a nutshell, basically the main, the main hypothesis of Cato and my interpretation. Okay. Very good. Now, there are a lot of comments that one can do. The first comment is that uh, some of these statements have a nice physical interpretation. I insisted first with the, on the picture with the first one, that the circulation of the second one is not too big. It comes also with the fact that the energy near the, the object, it's only the energy near the object, which, because u nu square will be an energy, which plays a role. And, that's, uh, and this is maybe the two most important observations on this kind of thing. So, and so that's, and then, the, why I call that the if and the only if condition is because in the, absent, in the presence of a smooth solution of the Euler equation, you have no other hypothesis, just the absence of the anomalous energy dissipation to obtain that the, at the, visco, at the zero viscosity limit will be equivalent to the perturbation of persistence of regularity in this limit. So, of course, conservation of energy at the limit. Now, the condition which involves the energy is something that is worth mentioning because it just involves not 
oh, what's happened in th away from the flood, not happen n exactly on the boundary, but in a region which will be away from the boundary, a fraction of viscosity, and located in a bigger fraction of the viscosity. And that was also observed in a paper of Drivas and Yen, which goes back in 2018. And that's really a basic observation. And this observation appeared also, I already mentioned it appeared, it, it, it has also been observed by numerical simulation in series of paper of my Farge, Klein, Yen, and Schneider, and they really show that the turbulent vorticity is generated in this subregion. Now, it's also uh, now one can also say observe that the, the cathode criteria. It's a criteria. It doesn't say the cathode criteria to keep in mind that give condition for which you will have no energy dissipation equivalent to persistence of regularity. But it does not say that it, this is what will happen all the time. In fact, it's the contrary. One can expect that in most of the time, and that will, I will elaborate on that for the last part of my talk, it's uh, in most of the case the Cato criteria should not be valid. And uh, this is, and one of the, and that, and before going to that, I can say, I'd add one other thing about the, uh, uh, the sub layer. If I look at the sub layer, as I said, it's what's happened in the, uh, it's where one should suppose that the critical thing will happen. And this is also well in uh, agreement, this notion of turbulence in the sub-layer with the uh, wall law which was proposed by Prandtl in 1930 and von Karman. They, ca they call this region the turbulent layer and it's also the thing you find in the book of Lando and Lipschitz. Let's say the classical Prand layer was revealed by Prand at the beginning of the previous century, 1904, and then they found with the fact that it doesn't, may not appear, and phenomena may be different and re related to the notion of turbulence in 1930. Okay, and from, if you want to look at the mathematic issue for that, you f there is one striking way, it was the first contribution of Wayne and A and Born Enquist. They look at where the singularity of the Prandtl equation may appear, and they well, then see if things go back, and they found that the Prandtl solution may become singular, not on the boundary, but in a region which is detached to the boundary by something of this order. After that, there were many other discussions about the Prandtl equation, especially in the younger generation. Okay. And uh, as all this discussion did involve the uh, no sleep boundary condition, because that's what made appear what I call the bad term. Now, if you replace the no sleep boundary condition by and Navier Stokes, the fact that the fluid is tangent, plus a boundary condition of this type, you could express that this term either as you knew on the boundary or as the stress tensor on the boundary, so a quantity of this type, with a lambda nu which is bounded, then all what I talk disappear, the solution, the limit will be smooth and nice exactly in the, as in the case where you have no boundary. Now this, as I, maybe that's a comment that I made at the beginning of my talk, is that the situation of the, the no sleep boundary condition is justified by the fact that it, uh, that it generates at the limit something which are turbulence, 
which correspond to what Uriel show, has shown in his book at the beginning when he uh, tell you, I uh, will show you what is turbulence, and he show a picture of turbulence generated by a grid. He called that grid turbulence. So I want to s keep in mind that since you get complicated uh, for problem with the boundary effect and with the zero viscosity boundary condition, that will may imply that the zero boundary condition is the thing which is natural. And if you and if the Cato criteria is not satisfied, then another hint to uh, say that it's not it's it natural that it should not be satisfied is if you is if the idea of going back to the D'Alembert paradox, and you know that if you go if the limit is a, goes nicely to a smooth solution of the Euler equation, then there will be no force on the flying object, no force bird or plane will not fly. So the fact that plane fly would indicate that the general case where the Cato criteria is not satisfied is the natural situation. And the last thing I want to comment on that is to go back to the this picture that you find in any type of book of fluid mechanic you have an airfoil you have the velocity which goes above here goes below the airfoil and you have a line of discontinuity which separate the velocity above and the velocity below and when you have an, and the, nice, the line of discontinuity is just the discontinuity between the tangential velocity in the sense of fluid mechanic that will be a, a, it's a tangential uh, with a, it's a, it's a, it will be called or in, in our language it will be, it's a non a, it's a non it's a contact just a contact discontinuity at variance with a shock. So you have a contact, and it carries the name of Kelvin Helmholtz. I will go back to that. So if you go back, if you would imagine that this solution is the limit of a solution of Navier-Stokes, smooth, then it should pick the very smooth solution here. Now, what is you get a smooth solution? The fluid is potential at infinity. It will remain potential by propagation everywhere. So it will be solution of an elliptic equation. And when you have a, so an elliptic equation with a, with a boundary condition outside the domain with a corner, you have a singularity here. But the singularity sits there. So you don't have this line, the line which is used by uh, all the engineers in conjunction with the uh, with the Kuta Zhukovsky formula to compute the air, the drift and the air. This, so you expect that. So you expect that it should go to something which is like the Kelvin Helmholtz. Now at this point, what I can say is not as precise as theorem which I have shown you before. The uh, first. This line, which what is precise, is a Kelvin Helmholtz solution. So, as a Kelvin Helmholtz solution is something which is unstable altogether, but mathematically it has some very good stability. It's analytic this curve, and this is the recent result of of last several few years ago of C. G. Wu and, and also Gilles Lebeau. Now, if I want to connect with this most recent thing of the family of convex integration, they came with an idea that there will be some, they are able to construct solution that dissipate energy and that while in the same start when the smooth initial data and with the discontinuity so here and this they look the general uh, uh, singularity that will live near the vor this vortex and will look really like the one that are observed in nature well very good at this point trying to try to to s s say, to prove 
whether or not the solution of the Navier Stokes will pick something like that or something close to some wild solution, it's still a general open problem. One can prove some partial results, we have some work in going, but it's mostly, in this case, difficult to decide what will be the limit. So I have almost uh, finished my talk. I have just want to add one word to tell you that, which will be my own critique about what I have talked. I mean, it's not my own, it's a comment of Sinober. I gave this type of talk or some res related result at a meeting on turbulence and uh, what uh, Arkady came, he said, Claude, you are working, to, uh, talking about the Cauchy problem, taking the initial data, looking how the thing work. Now, I think you are sitting in a plane, and that uh, the, the, mo the motion of the plane moves also with time, is not stable and, co and constant. What will be, what the people will think in the plane? And it's not, a stupid comment, but because the air, all this construction I've done is for a finite time, discussed from zero to t, whether it converts, whether it not converts, whether something will happen. And it's going to, time going to infinity will be much closer to what Edris talks about in his previous uh, talk, and it's much more difficult. But on the other hand, I still think that to make progress if, 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 at the level of mathematics, partial differential analysis, and so on, it's natural to start to look carefully at the Cauchy problem, the initial data, and how the stability depends on that. So that's it. Thank you. I don't know. Thanks for your patience. I don't uh, if I have over time or not. But. Well, we started a little late, but uh, thank you very much. I guess we're supposed to have a, a, a discussion period now led by Uriel. So maybe it would be better to uh, start that now and then people can ask questions about. Okay, we can uh, put it all together. Yeah, sure. Wait, 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 wait. Just, just. Uriel, is that okay or? Oh, Uriel is not. Uriel is not here. Well, he, he yeah. I heard. All right, boy. now you hear me. Yes. Yes. I'm supposed to be the cheerleader of the discussion, and uh, it is uh, not a good idea to merge. I don't mis mean that we shall not return to the various things, or at least to some of these, but um, there may be. Let me se separate things. If there are some relatively narrow questions uh, to, to find out what's going on uh, rather than the more philosophical, it, it may be of, of interest to discuss them now, but we shall certainly come back to this during this discussion, uh, which will perhaps even last mo more than one hour. We shall see. So I have a question, maybe for for Cloud. Um, so the, I, I I think this is all really beautiful work, and I think it's very interesting, and it's maybe in some sense just beginning because there's still a lot to understand. Um, so far, I've not seen any clear distinction in the mathematical work between what the fluid mechanicians call rough versus smooth walls. So they don't mean that in the mathematical sense. In fact, a wall with nice smooth, you know, a, a manifold with sort of nice sinusoidal ripples would be what they would call hydraulically rough. And in pipe flow with hydraulically smooth walls, the energy dissipation appears to go to zero in the infinite Reynolds number limit. Whereas with hydraulically rough walls, um, it doesn't. I mean, it, it, go, it, it, it appears to go to a constant value independent of Reynolds number at high Reynolds number. So is there anything in the mathematical uh, theorems that, I, that I've missed that sort of distinguishes and explains the role of this roughness? Okay, uh, can I answer to that? Please. 
I have a, I have a comment because I have been observed, exposed to several papers. I think the, the one I saw were with Charles Doring, done by Charles Doring and co-workers. And uh, they took this example, which I mentioned at the end, the sleep boundary condition, no right. And they find out that you have turbulence generated by the boundary, which all the time goes on, and at the end of the day, spread in the boundary, in the domain. So it's really a question, it's really the question, my, the question by my last slide or my last comment, are you play the game of letting, of taking a finite time, fixed finite, and let the viscosity go to zero and measure the, the regularity in terms of all deaths or whatever, whatsoever you want, or you do a computation for time which are fixed but much larger compared to the way the viscosity go to zero. Or the viscosity going to zero faster. No, the time going, the time be too large with respect to the risk. I had the feeling because I've seen that also. I think, I think this will require longer discussion. So maybe, are there any other short questions for? Well, no, actually, uh, I probably would like to maybe uh, remind Claude that he can comment more on that related to your question, Greg. Uh, uh, Claude, wasn't there some work by Gerard Verre about rough boundaries? There are many work about rough, rough boundary, even in the case of linear problem. It was very popular by the time people who were looking, uh, motivated by Star Wars or things like that. And uh, so you have exactly the first for linear problem, there is huge literature leading, uh, relating the wavelength of the wave and the size of the singularity. And then you can play the same game for fluid and it becomes much more complicated because it's non-linear. And I don't remember what's the paper of Vare, but surely it's, it is in this family. The first series of paper or even were by uh, Senior Lyons and they were about uh, homogenization for let's say large smooth solutions, which I would call with rough boundary. And you and you could play the game, but uh, the, 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 that's a it's a big area to play with that. Okay, I'm I'm glad to hear that. I don't know the the, the this literature. 